If you've been paying attention to news in the Internet of Things space for, I don't know, the last few years, you probably came across this term called thread. It's a weird generic name, I know, but bear with me. It is the next big thing for IoT wireless networks. Essentially, it competes with things like Z-Wave and Zigbee for connecting smart home devices, but I'll show you why it's better. At the end, I'll give you a brief demo showing one of the newer thread-capable microcontrollers. Thread was started by the Thread Group Alliance in 2014, which is a collection of industry players like ARM, NXP, Silicon Labs, and most recently, Apple. They wanted to create a standardized networking protocol for smart home devices that existed somewhere between the low power of Bluetooth and the power-hungry Wi-Fi. It should be an open spec, unlike Z-Wave, and it needed to fix some of the networking issues that you might find in, say, Zigbee. Oh, and it should have security built right into the spec. Much like Zigbee, Thread operates on the IEEE 802.15.4 physical layer and media access control sublayer. This is a wireless standard for low-rate personal area networks originally defined in 2003. Originally, it allowed for operation in one of three frequency bands. You'll see 868 MHz channels in Europe, 915 MHz channels in the Americas, and the ever-popular 2.4 GHz ISM band for most of the world. Later amendments to the standard opened up the 780 MHz and 950 MHz channels for China and Japan. Additionally, the 802.15.4a amendment expanded the physical layers to include ultra-wideband operation in the under 1 GHz, 3 to 5 GHz, and 6 to 10 GHz ranges. So, what does this mean? Well, the spec allows for data rates up to 250 kilobits per second, and you can achieve this on some of the current thread-enabled chips. Measuring range is always tricky with wireless. However, you can expect similar performance to that of Zigbee. The spec originally conceived of a personal area network no more than about 10 meters. Depending on the particular frequency, power output, and antenna configuration, you can generally expect ranges up to about 30 meters, assuming line of sight. Of course, being indoors means multipath propagation or trying to punch through walls, which can really limit this range. Expect around 10 meters indoors. However, Thread allows for meshing of its routers, which means the more devices you bring to the network, the more coverage you can get. We'll look at how Thread handles mesh networking in a few minutes. Moving up the OSI model, we find that 6 Lopan steps in for the logical link control sublayer and network layer. 6 Lopan stands for IPv6 over low power wireless personal area networks. Thread exclusively uses 6 Lopan for managing connections and routing packets. IPv6 allows for many, many more addresses on a network than the old IPv4 system. Because IPv6 can allow for 340 trillion addresses, IoT devices can be uniquely addressed on the internet, which makes routing data across networks more efficient. 6 Lopan was specifically designed for low-power devices, including microcontrollers. Rather than needing large network cards, single system-on-chip devices and battery-operated IoT devices can be fully discoverable by other internet-connected devices. That does mean, however, we need a border router that can translate other internet traffic from Ethernet and Wi-Fi to our 802.15.4 network, as they are different protocols. We'll look at border routers in a bit. Thread is a networking protocol built using 802.15.4 and 6 Lopan. It offers reliability through meshing and encrypted communication among nodes. It uses UDP for maintaining the mesh network and can support any other IPv6-based transport layer protocols, such as TCP. There's some academic debate around whether the session and presentation layers actually mean anything in modern networking. For our purposes, we can just say that Thread covers everything up to the application layer to assist with networking and routing. Zigbee creeps into the application layer by specifying software objects that developers must interact with to assist with network management. Unlike Zigbee, Thread clearly stops before the application layer to allow maximum freedom for developers. This is similar to how modern networking operates, but for low-power IoT devices. 
With all the technical details out of the way, let's see how Thread achieves this networking magic. A Thread network consists of a mesh of one or more routers and non-meshed end devices. The routers are shown as diamonds and the end devices are circles. Routers act as a type of parent node. Their job is to forward packets to other devices in the network and to securely commission new devices when they want to join the network. As a result of these responsibilities, routers must always have their radios on. End devices, on the other hand, act as children. Each end device can only be associated with one router at a time. End devices can search for a new parent if their router becomes lost or if there is a router with a better connection, but generally, end devices will only communicate with a single router in the network. End devices cannot forward packets in the network. As such, they are allowed to disable their radios to save on power. Each thread network must have a single thread leader. This leader node is responsible for managing the other routers in the network. Zigbee and Z-Wave support mesh networking like Thread, and they require a controller or coordinator node just like our leader here. However, in Zigbee and Z-Wave, that controller node could not change. You needed to buy a hub to specifically act as this controller. Thread is different. The leader node self-elects from the available routers, so as long as you have at least one router in your Thread network, you do not need to buy a special hub controller. If the leader goes down, another router will simply take its place. This self-healing property makes Thread extremely robust and able to reconfigure itself when you add or remove nodes. Interestingly enough, Thread also supports border routers. These are nodes that are able to translate packets from non-Thread networks to Thread networks and vice versa. This might be something like your Wi-Fi router with a Thread coprocessor and radio. Such a router could talk to both your Wi-Fi and Thread devices. You can also turn a Raspberry Pi into a border router with a simple thread USB adapter. You should note that there are some limits to the number of devices in a single thread network. Each network can only have one leader and a maximum of 32 routers. However, there can be up to 511 end devices per router, which means you can easily have thousands of nodes in a single network. Thread nodes can be configured in a variety of ways. If you're going to develop something with thread, then I recommend becoming familiar with some of this terminology. The nodes can be configured as either full thread devices, FTDs, or as minimal thread devices, MTDs. An FTD always has its radio on, subscribes to the all routers multicast IPv6 address, and maintains the address mappings. We already discussed routers. They are nodes whose radio is always on and can mesh with other routers. Router eligible end devices are end devices by default, which means that they do not mesh and only talk to one parent. However, they have the option to become a router. Full end devices talk to a single router, but must still have their radios on at all time. However, they can never be promoted to a router. MTDs consist of only end devices. They do not subscribe to the all routers multicast address and must forward any messages to their associated parent. The minimal end device has its radio always on, whereas a sleepy end device can turn its radio off to save power. The sleepy end device can wake up occasionally to pull for messages from its parent router. Now that you have a basic understanding of what Thread is, let's talk about why you might want to use it. First of all, Thread promises interoperability among IoT devices that implement Thread. Even though the standard is open, it's still recommended that you certify your products, which means that the testing procedures guarantee you meet the standard. It also allows you to display the Thread logo on your product, and it's how the Thread group makes money. Thread is specifically targeted at smart home devices. That means your clocks, refrigerators, speakers, televisions, smart bulbs, security cameras, thermostats, and alarms can all talk to each other without having to buy into a single wireless protocol like Zigbee or Z-Wave. Ideally, all of these devices will talk Thread in the future, but it doesn't matter which vendor you buy them from, it'll just work. Well, that's the theory anyway. I know that this is another standard that gets thrown into the mix, but with all of the big name companies backing thread, hopefully this will be the protocol to rule all protocols, at least for non-Wi-Fi smart home stuff. There are a number of silicon vendors that are already making thread-capable modules and microcontrollers.
One of the easiest ways to get started right now is with the Silicon Labs ERF32MG24 chips. The ERF32X G24 Dev Kit, also known as the Thunderboard Sense 2, is a slick development board packed with sensors and is thread capable. It has an ARM Cortex M33 running at 78 MHz with 256 kilobytes of RAM and 1.5 megabytes of flash. This is plenty powerful enough for most basic smart home devices that don't require, say, streaming video. It's also able to run a number of edge machine learning applications, so think wake word detection on your IoT device. Another good dev board is the new SparkFun Thing Plus Matter board. It has a Silicon Labs MGM 240p module, which has the same ERF32 microcontroller I mentioned above, but the antenna is built into the module. While it lacks the sensors of the other dev kit, it's a slimmer form factor and has a micro SD card slot. Let's load some demo applications onto these boards and get them to talk to each other over thread. Silicon Labs Simplicity Studio comes with a number of demos and examples that you can look at in order to play around with thread. For example, on our Thunderboard Sense 2, there is an open thread CLI full thread device example that we can look at. So if we go to main.c, you can see everything that's going on here and you can see all the source code. I've already built this, so I'm going to go ahead and flash this to my dev board. So here's my Thunderboard or the EFR32X G24. I'm going to right click. Interestingly enough, you don't want to connect. You just want to say upload application. And we're going to go to the path here. And we're going to go to wherever we have Simplicity Studio, which I believe is in my users. And in users, we have my users, Simplicity Studio. We have my workspace. And here is the open thread CLI full thread device. In here, go to your GNU ARM. This is where everything gets built. You want to look for the .s37. That's our compiled firmware. There's other options here too, like your binary or hex, but let's go with that. So we'll open that. We don't need a bootloader for this image, although that's usually a good thing to have. And I am going to say erase the chip. So I'm going to say OK and let that upload to my development board. If you get something like this, an unspecified error, I usually find it's helpful to unplug the device and plug it back in. Make sure your USB connector is seated. And we will try that again. So we will upload the application. We will select the OTCLI FTD. Select OK. Let's erase chip. Let's try again. There we go. And once that is done, you should see Simplicity Commander status OK. And we're going to do the same thing to the SparkFun Thing Plus Matter Board, but that uses a different example. What we have here is the SparkFun Thing Plus OTCLI MTD for minimal thread device. And you can take a look here at the source code for that. I'm going to right click. Interestingly enough, for this one, we do have to connect first. Once we have it connected, I'm going to say upload application. Let's go to our application here, which is the OTCLI MTD. Go to wherever that was built and let's upload that. We will erase the chip, say OK, and let that upload. Once again, we have another error here, so I'm going to disconnect the board from my computer, reconnect it, make sure that all the USB connectors are seated properly. And let's try this again. Once we've connected, let's upload application. Make sure we're in the SparkFun board, wherever the build is. We'll say S3, S37, say OK, erase the chip. And sometimes when this happens, I find that I need to go and click on my project. And sometimes we can go to the file itself, right click, say flash to device. Make sure we select our SparkFun board and it brings up a slightly different Flash programmer. This should work, so I'm just going to say program. And that one works a little better than trying to use the adapter over here for whatever reason. So now you see the two different ways to flash programs to the actual end devices. So we'll close out of that. If you're interested in recreating this demo and how to open this source code, I will post a link in the description to that tutorial. Now that we have the firmware burned to both of the boards, our Thunderboard Sense 2 is going to be the full thread device. That's the firmware we burned. And I have it connected 
to a serial terminal over COM5. The SparkFun board is the minimal thread device that's going to be connected over the serial terminal to COM9. These are the CLI demos, which means we can interact with a command line interface. We can call things like help to see the available commands, if config to see the state of the radio. And in order to create a thread network, we need to call dataset init new. This creates a new network configuration. It's also known as a dataset. And we need to call dataset commit active. This commits the dataset to non-volatile storage so that the device remembers that dataset even between resets. Then we can call if config up to bring up the radio. And from there, we want to call thread start to join the network that we just created. If we call state, you might see something that says detached. We actually need to wait about 10 seconds for the device to join that network. So I can just keep calling state until it says leader. This device, the full thread device, is now the leader of this thread network. And we can call data set to check the network configuration. And IP ADDR to view the IPv6 addresses. Note that there are multiple addresses per interface. This is something that you'll find in IPv6, so I recommend digging into that if you'd like to learn more. What we're looking for is the MLEID, or the Mesh Local Endpoint ID. To get that, we can call IPADDRMLEID. That should give us just the address to that particular endpoint, and that's what we need to get these two to talk to each other. On the minimal thread device, that SparkFun board, we want to do dataset, channel, and then the channel number given by the leader, which in this case is channel 20. And then we want to do dataset network key. And we want to copy the key from the other one there. This will allow the two to communicate with each other. And we want to call dataset commit active, which will commit the dataset to non-volatile memory, just like we did in the other device. And then we want to enable the thread interface by calling if config up, and then thread start. And once again, you want to watch that state. So give it about 10 seconds. After that time, yeah, give it a little more time here. Let's try it again. There it goes. It says child. So the first one is the leader. And then this minimal thread device is now the child in this node setup for the thread network. We can check our data set here. You can see we're on channel 20. We've got our network key. Uh, notice that the data set does not have as much information as it does for the leader device. You can take a look at the IPv6 addresses that are available. And just like we did before, we want that endpoint ID. And you notice that the endpoint IDs are different between the devices. Now, these two devices are on the same wireless network. Yes, they're getting power from my computer. But what we care about is the fact that they can communicate wirelessly over this thread network. And the most common way to check that is to do a simple ping. So I've got the address of this first device. So I'm going to type ping. I'm going to paste that in. And sure enough, we have 16 bytes from the device received. It made a round trip, and it's done. So we could ping the FTD from the MTD. And of course, we should do it the other way around. So we type ping. We get the MLEID from the MTD device. So we paste that in. And sure enough, we can ping back and forth between the two devices. So now you are set up to develop applications on top of a thread network. The terms thread and matter definitely confused me when I first started looking into this stuff. Matter is a completely separate standard built for the application layer that can use thread, Wi-Fi, or other protocols to make all of your devices talk to each other. I'll go over matter in a future episode, but for now, I hope you have a better understanding of how thread works. Happy hacking!